Like as an elite athlete, I really grew up with this sense of um, always going for more, always working harder, always getting it more and more right. And that's great, right? If you want to perform at a high level, great. But to have that be my only switch was really hard. Welcome, Welcome to Untrained. Untrained. Hey, Whitney. Hey, Iris. We've got a repeat. This is uh, take two of a guest that we love so much, Dr. Amanda Blake. Back by popular demand. Back by popular demand. A hugely successful podcast we had. People love it. They quote it. Um, So we're so happy to have you back. Dr. Amanda Blake is a master somatic leadership coach and author of the award-winning book, Your Body is Your Brain. And we brought her back today for a very interesting conversation because we all have something in common, our elite athletic background, and it influences us today. So Whitney, what is our topic for today? Well, it it stemmed from when we finished our conversation last time, we felt like we could go on and on and on forever. And what we wanted to explore more fully is the relationship between performance and our bodies and the ways we trained our bodies or our bodies trained us um, around performance and belonging. And so we can each speak to this in our in individual sports and individual bodies and how that has played out. Um, but that's a conversation we want to explore further today, the relationship between our bodies, performance, and belonging. Well, let's bring Dr. Blake in, Mandy. I'd love to know, just when we brought this topic up, you're like, oh, I love this topic. What is it about this topic of performance belonging in our bodies that is so important to you? Well, you know, it's not something that I that I write about or teach about a lot. Although I actually, now that I've said that, do have a practice that I do really, really regularly around body of performance and body of learning. So we can talk about that. Um, it's something that I find really a really helpful tool to shift from a sense of striving, which I feel like as an elite athlete, I really grew up with this sense of um always going for more, always working harder, always getting it more and more right. And that's great, right? If you want to perform at a high level, great. But to have that be my only switch was really hard. Um, Created a lot of benefits in my life, but also a lot of challenges in my life. And then I'm also kind of curious about, you know, belonging, teams, team sports, some sports are really more individual. And I, I ju- it's just kind of a curiosity for me about how different experiences of belonging early in life or in our sport life might translate into how we show up in the world. So it's so, a personal mm-hmm. curiosity. It's part of my life experience. It's something nobody on other, any other podcast has really asked me about. And I was like, I would love to talk to you guys about this. Well, yeah, let's just our sports, right? So I love that you said some are individual, some are team. I did an individual sport in fencing. We do have a team aspect to it, but really we're performing individually on on the strip that we call we call the strip. What about you, Whitney? Your background is in in rowing, Um, and I was just listening to Boys in the Boat with my kids, um, which talks, which is a rowing sport, but and it. Rowing, you know, they have the teamwork posters with rowing, you know, it's very often represents teamwork because you all have to cross the finish line together and you have to work together. You have to literally become one unit in order to have your best performance. Um, So I feel very connected to um, belonging uh, perform for me, my body, my my embodied experience of performance with my sport is very tied to belonging. Yeah, and and I would say the same. So I was a synchronized swimmer, and in it, it, there's something similar to rowing in that everyone is moving together, mm-hmm. and even more so than in dance on land, right where. Lots of people might be doing lots of different things. In synchronized swimming, only half of your body is out of the water at any given time. And because you can see so much less, like a lot of the choreography is a- about doing things together. 
I should say it is the name of the sport has changed. It is now called artistic swimming, right? So it's no longer when I was doing it back in the ancient days, it was called synchronized swimming. And it was actually about being together, synchronized. It was very, very much about it similar to rowing. You can't be even, you know, a millimeter or a nanosecond off because it will throw the whole system off. So there's something very interesting there about sensing into what your team is doing at the same time. And we could talk about that, but actually, Iris, I'm thinking about this in terms of fencing. Like, it seems like you have to be very, um, of course, visually attuned, but also really sensory, I'm guessing, really attuned in a sensory way to what your opponent's doing and what next move they might make. And I don't know if I'm using the right terminology opponent, right? But like, it, 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 my guess would be you have to be pretty tuned in. So I'm curious about that for you. Yeah, I appreciate that question. I'm, and now I'm thinking about the most fun part about fencing is having that dance with the other person. Fencing with someone, it is a combat sport, but the most fun people have is when you bring your best game, I bring my best game, and we're kind of like talking. We we think about it as a conversation. It's hard to fence someone when they're speaking a different language, when they're not really responding. In fencing, it's not a random, random set of actions. There's definitely, as you get better and better, you have these sort of um, anticip anticipatory moves. If I do this, typically someone will do this. And so as you work up the chain, you understand that there's these patterns like chess. And so when someone can understand those patterns and then push you to a higher level of understanding, that conversation can get deeper, kind of like our podcast, right? Like when the conversation can get deeper and deeper, it becomes so exciting and it's definitely in tune. And um, it's also in in a combat sport for us is you, you also have to be very in tune with yourself too is you can't be too much or too little um you can't be um uh too aggressive or too defensive there's a balance you need to strike within yourself too as well as balancing what's happening on the on the fencing strip so I, that's what i love about combat sports um, i would kind of do you mind if i jump in and just say something about yeah. that because it it reminds me of something um, really specific that I that I teach about a lot, and I teach this to leaders. I also do a lot of teaching in the in the coaching field and in kind of the helping professions, and it's really relevant there as well. Which is a a way of thinking about what it means to be present, which is to have your attention simultaneously on yourself and another or a group of others at the same time. So you can feel yourself, you can sense yourself, you are inhabiting your own body in a sensory, experiential, felt sense way, but you're not so kind of self-focused, navel-gazing, self-obsessed that you can't also really have your attention with, you know, your combat opponent or your person across the table that you're negotiating from or your boss or your, right? Like... That, that you're able to encompass yourself and another in the same circle of attention and to do that in a really felt sense way. And that's a very powerful way for us to have an attuned communication. You're talking about a conversation that happens through movement, but in the workplace, we talk about conversation that happens through words but it's the same thing. Like when you're talking about it gets clunky, we can get clunky in our word-based conversations in the same kind of way. And I imagine we all know what that feels like. So I'm just going to pause there. And yeah, I, I, I have some, I have, well, I have two places to go, but I'm going to go in the work direction, which is I have a lot, a number of clients right now who have just, you know, there, maybe there's been layoffs some reorg and they've been <laughs> rewarded for their great performance by having lots more work dumped onto their plate. And so, and they're, completely overwhelmed and so i've been i mean not in that same way but helping them with their 
superpower is their presence. And if they lose their presence, they cannot solve this. So what? So the first order of business is not solving the problem, which is what they want to do, because that's going to take time, but figuring out how are they going to remain present? How are they going to be able to access the wisdom that they have? And if they slip into overwhelm, um, that's going to be really challenging. And I, and I particularly like the, because many of them are acclimating to new teams or taking over new teams, that idea of self attuning to the self, checking in with that, as well as being attuned to the other. So do you want to riff off that, that a little bit? I, I do actually, it reminds me of what I was saying earlier about the body of performer, body of a learner. That was the language I used, but that's the language I often use. And, and so like, like I said, in my own life, I may have been saying this before we, we actually hit record, but in my own life, high performance was, you know, gave me so many good things, so many good outcomes. And it also sometimes came at a cost. And when we get all that like extra dumped on us, I think my instinct based on my kind of embodied orientation around performance would be to work harder, strive harder, try harder, push harder, you know, push through the difficulty and the pain. Great. Those are, those are all good instincts. We don't need to like throw those away, but there are other ways of being as well. And especially in situations where the intensity ratchets up, if you think about, I really think about this from an athletic perspective. Like if you think, I, I often use the example of a diver because I think it's very easy to visualize like a diver on a platform, you know, 15 or 25 feet above the water is getting ready to dive and they have, they're ready to perform, but think about what they do. Like they're physically shaking their body out. They're doing everything they can to get as relaxed as possible before the performance. And as a swimmer, I mean, I was around divers all the time. So I, maybe this is just easy for me to visualize because I got to see it a lot. Um, but I know I did the same thing, right? Before I went into a competition, there there was a way that I had of readying and relaxing at the same time. Mm. So the thing that I often teach is a, is a physical felt sense contrast around what it feels like to be in the body of a performer, or sometimes I say an A mm-hmm. student, or we could say an elite athlete, right? So being in that embodiment of what it means to be kind of reaching, striving, and then relaxing that into the body of sort of relaxed readiness, or sometimes, especially if I'm in a situation where people are in a learning environment, relaxing that into the body of a learner or an explorer or discovery. So sometimes I will talk about like a kid exploring tide pools, right? Is in a really different physical state than someone who's readying themselves for someone who's like kind of striving for for performance. But when you really look at it at a very elite level, that performance, like right before you go, I'm curious for both of you, what your experience has been. I always did better when I when I was in that sense of relaxed readiness as opposed to like a tense striving. I friggin' always wanted to trade place with a stake the person who holds the boat. I every single time as a starting line, I'm like, why do I do this? I hate this so much. I hate this. I'm so nervous I can't even possibly stand it. So I don't think that I will go this is an interesting place. You know, for me, I don't think I ever achieved that. I have in other places as I've gotten older. And I've and I've also As I've gotten older, I've chosen the things where I can have that relaxed driving. There's some, I'm not a keynote speaker because I can't have that relaxed driving. It's just not fun. But the places where I can, that's where I continue to put my energy because it feels good. And I don't like the way the overwhelming anxiety feels anymore. Yeah. Um, I I think early in my fencing career when I was, I'm definitely more of a learner. And if I'm in a state of, learning or a state of process, I can have more fun. And I definitely have a goofiness to me. So when I'm performing well, I'm goofy and laughing, having fun and talking and I'm learning and I'm in in process. Later on my career, when it felt like 
people put expectations on me and I didn't know what to do with that. I remember actually receiving a large sum of money to train. Like people were believing in me and gave me um, lots of money to fence. And then I was like, well, I have to perform now because uh, people believe in me. So I got to do this. Right. So I was in a state of performance at all times. Practice was performance. Everything was performance. There was no levity. There was no state of, of being that I felt comfortable. in. so later on my career, I wasn't as fluid as I was when I was younger. And there are other reasons for that too, but I definitely remember there was definitely some thresholds of should or have to. I also remember, you know, winning one year, I won a world champion under 17 and then the next year going to the tournament at world championships and feeling like I should perform and I and it just fell short um, and then the following year because I didn't feel like I have to or should I won again so it was every time I was put in a position where it was about the performance about the outcome and not about learning or the process or having fun with it I definitely couldn't be in the proper state so I agree with you I think I needed to be in a sort of happy, uh, relaxed and focused state. And it was very hard for me to get there as when I felt an immense amount of pressure to do something. And it wasn't mm -hmm. that other people felt like that. I, I personally put that on myself. Yeah. Uh, I'm kind of curious, Whitney, you looked like you were going to say something there. Do you want to say, and then I have a question for you. Well, I was just going to say, I didn't stay in rowing because of the racing. I actually didn't like it. I, I liked the sense of belonging. I liked the training. I liked all the other things. Um, and luckily in rowing, like the percentage of training to racing is <laughs> ridiculous ratio. So it sort of worked out in my favor. But, um, you know, I never achieved what you're talking about in the, the peak performance elements. I mean, I could perform, but I didn't enjoy it. I'm curious for you, did the sense of belongingness come through for you in those moments of like high demand, high pressure, high performance, were you able to find some sense of relaxation or did it stay with you for the whole race? This sense of like um, nervousness and. Yeah. Well, there, there's some, there's some peak moments, but I think the other th unique thing about rowing, it's a beautiful sport and there's so many wonderful things about it, but like at its heart, it's about how hard you push. Like it's, it's rewards people who, push themselves till they vomit. You know, it rewards this dig deep, persevere, resilient efforting. So, you know, as soon as you're out of the nervous zone, you're into the, uh, you know, a lot of pain zone. Um, but one of the ways that showed up or that, that training is kicked in is when I get into stressful situations, I just want to get to the finish line. Like mm -hmm. my whole body is like, let's go as fast and hard as we can so we can get to the finish line so then we can relax. Mm -hmm. Like I don't have this like, oh, let's figure out how we can be relaxed while <laughs> we're doing this. It's like, let's get it over with, then we can relax. And that has stayed with me and just in the last six months bit me in the butt really hard because I didn't even notice it because it's so hardwired. Um, so that's one way that, that that early training just lives in me. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? How it, whatever it is that we were practicing and practicing, we're practicing and practicing and practicing and practicing, and then it shows up in all the other areas of our lives, yes. right? So synchronized swimming, it's so precision oriented. It's so perfectionist oriented. It's so performance oriented, right? Unlike other sports, you're meant to like be smiling and look like it, make it all look so easy and never let them see you sweat, right? So all of that stayed with me for a really long time. And it would actually cause me a lot of stress in in the background until um, one day I, I read a blog post by a writer that I really enjoy and she was talking about loving her typos. Mm -hmm. And it became a little bit of like a... Um, um, like a motto for me in a certain way where I, I had to kind of unlearn that never let him see you sweat and be willing to, especially as I, you know, published a book, got more visibility in the world. Like I had to be okay with, Hey, sometimes you make mistakes in public. Sometimes there's a typo. It's not the end of the world, but I had very much trained in this, um, 
mindset and way of being that was around this really high level of precision and perfection. And holding your breath. <laughs> While holding your breath. Talk about that. Right? <laughs> that seems well, it's a crazy hard sport. I don't actually know why anyone does it. Um <laughs> It's so hard. I don't even so hard. I just picture those little nose clip and that. I, you know, <laughs> like, I, I can't breathe, but I'm I yeah. can't breathe, but I'm having a really good time. Give me a nasty. I will say if it's 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 a super fun sport. I guess that's why people do it. I loved it. I love the feeling in my body. Like there are days when I just kind of like miss the the feeling of you know the kinds of moves that that we would make, but, um, and sometimes I'll go out, go out here where I live and swim in the lake and, and fool around. And people are like, what is that person doing? <laughs> are they okay? <laughs> it's um, really upside down. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. I, um, you know, for me, my story is pretty similar in some ways with perfectionism, but that was because I had, um, a coach who was like very verbally and emotionally abusive. I've been dealing with that for my whole life. Um, Meaning I've been sort of working on that trauma. I've been diagnosed with PTSD and that, and there was no actual safety in making a mistake. Cause once you made a mistake, there was punishment Mm -hmm. and there was immediate punishment in fencing. You can take a weapon and you could whip the weapon they, it would be okay. Like that's how coaches would learn is like, if the person didn't do the perfect action, then you could as a coach smack the, smack the mask or smack the body. And that was an okay thing. So you never, so I've had to train myself that making a mistake, I'll be safe. It'll be okay. And this belonging piece really makes sense because um, if I made a mistake, I wouldn't belong to this group. If I made a mistake, I, uh, the coach wouldn't pay attention to me. That was how extreme it was. Like if I, um, if I didn't do this right or correct or perfect, then I wouldn't get the attention I needed to train. I wouldn't get what I needed to train. So it had this sort of weird, (laughs) I have to retrain a lot. I mean, I have to say every time you have a big speaking gig, this comes up. Oh my God. It's, it's still in my system, but I think, um, you know, I think that's, that's the part of it. That's hardest is for a long time. I didn't want to tell people I was an Olympian because for me, it was so traumatic, the experience of having to deal with this. And I think, I know this feels extreme, but I can see it in clients too is, if they perform well, then you get all these things and, um, you know, you're never really in a state. Some clients don't feel like they can make mistakes um, at the job that they have, or maybe they have a leader that um, only rewards certain things um, and incentivizes performance only. Um, so they don't feel safe making a mistake. They don't feel safe learning in an environment. So I definitely feel um, empathetic towards that. Um that's the other piece about the Olympic stuff because people reward this type of behavior, right? So when you were talking about, oh, I was performing and I was perfectionist and you get onto a podium, same thing at work, right? So, you know, you get all these accolades for overwork. You get all these accolades that are, you know, maybe your um, people call me super organized, but that's because I have high levels of anxiety. I don't feel like making a mistake. So, but people reward that and they see you like, oh, she's hyper organized. So they give me wor- more work to organize. So, you know, I think sometimes we have to be careful of what we reward and careful of what feels like outward reward or respect for something that may not be what they really want to be respected for. Right. So I, I have this weird relationship to the Olympic Games. It makes everyone feel like I've done something, but it was very, it caused a lot of, traumatic experiences for me. So, I mean, that's all to say, you know, this is why we have this topic. This is why Whitney and I talk to each other all the time is how are we rewarding people? What are we really, um, what are we really proud of at the end of the day? Are we telling people that just what they're doing is outcomes or what they should be proud of, right? Like how can we be more broad in that spectrum? How can we reward people for their learning and their mistakes too in a work setting that makes sense? 
And when they get 8 million things piled onto their plate because there's been a reorg, how do we coach them around taking yes. care of themselves as much as we coach them around how do we help you get the outcome? I wanted to um, talk about the origins of where I first became aware of sport our bodies and belonging and performance. Um, I worked in the field of eating disorders for a long time, and I worked specifically in the intersection of sport and um, eating disorders. I had an eating disorder, and I worked in the field. That seems to be the way it works. But the, they, there was some research around the sport family, and the idea was that you know sometimes you needed to pull an athlete because they needed to attend to their health, right, mm-hmm. more than they needed to be a performing contributor, um, but that you wanted to be really careful because that person was part of a sport family. They had a sport family and didn't want to take that sport family away from them. And so that's when I first started really thinking about sport as family, sport as belonging, um, and how important it is to us, especially as these tribal beings that we are. And maybe we didn't get a sense of belonging early on, and maybe the first sense of that belonging comes when we are part of a, a sport team or an orchestra or who knows but then you can feel all that belonging but if you don't perform you don't get to belong and that gets tricky and interesting and I think we just need to hold a lot of respect for that and um, and then I, I, you know we can bring it into the the workplace where what what got us that sense of belonging? Was it because we would always let go of our needs to, for the greater good? Was it because we could push ourselves to the end of time? What was it that we relied on for that sense of belonging? And just being aware of that and conscious of that um, as we navigate stressful situations. So I'm going to go back to you, Mandy, and see what you have to say about that because you're on the front lines of this. Well, and you can you can probably see me chomping at the bit too. <laughs> what you feel it? What you both said? I'm 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 like yeah okay. We here's a little departure in the direction of evolutionary biology. Woo. So we uh, mammals are designed for belonging and emotional communication. And one of the key evolutionary pressures for, uh, well, let me back up a step. For all organisms, even single-celled organisms, one of the key evolutionary pressures is safety. And and our, one of the basic sort of biological capacities we have is to move towards or away, approach or avoid, based on assessments of safety and danger. And you'll see this even in single-celled organisms. And then as organisms get more complex you'll see much more complex behaviors. So in addition to moving towards and away or approach and avoid, we have all kinds of additional behaviors that that might um, come into play when we when we find ourselves in, in situations of safety or danger. So that's like one of the first evolutionary pressures that shaped the brain into the organ that it is. And then in mammals, a, a next evolutionary pressure is belonging. And part of the reason for that is that infant mammals, in most cases, the same thing is true of many birds, is that there's a um, there's a need to communicate to caregivers what your needs are in nonverbal ways in infancy as a small mammal that is entirely dependent on typically the mother for nourishment for protection for support for safety right so mothers and infants i have a a dear friend a colleague who studied mothers and infants human mothers and infants and their nonverbal communications and so so much of it is about connection and belonging and all of that in infancy like our our brains are wiring up for certain patterns of connection and belonging and especially if we are in sports when we're when we're quite quite young, when the brain is still developing, so it's still true in our teen years and into our twenties. But especially if we happen to start out pretty young, um, but younger than ten, right? Mm-hmm. We're really our brains and bodies are in really really rapid growth mode during that that period of our lives. So we wire up through not just our brain but our whole body patterns around how we get the belonging that we need and we'll each come in with like a different 
unique temperament and set of needs around belonging. But we'll we'll learn, oh, performance gets me belonging, or oh, cooperation gets me belonging, or oh, never making a mistake gets me belonging. And we need that. The the what I'm trying to say is like that it that is a non-negotiable key evolutionary pressure that shaped the evolution of the human brain to seek out optimal levels of belonging. And we will learn and put on autopilot those behaviors that satisfy that need. And then the third sort of major overarching evolutionary pressure is is what I refer to as respect or dignity. Really, it's about where do you fit in the social group? So this is also about belonging. And we know this because the neural density of species that are highly, highly social, like uh, cetaceans, whales and dolphins, or um, dogs and wolves, or uh, chimpanzees, or humans, that there's much higher neural density in the newer parts of the brain that are involved in sorting out social signals, where we fit in the social group. So these three things, safety, belonging, and respect, or safety, connection, and dignity, we could think we could use different words to describe them. But these are things that the brain is designed to really pay attention to, to optimize as best as possible, and to deliberately put on autopilot. So in other words, make unconscious, mm. easily accessible, mm. quickly available, those um ways of being, those patterns of behavior that get us the belonging that we need, that get us the respect that we seek, that get us responses of dignity and respect, right? So, um, okay, I'll stop there. And so drop the mic. That's what so. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I, just, I, I think we got our title, Evolutionary Pre Pressure, Synchronized Swimming and Belonging, I think is, <laughs> is now the title of this. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give an anecdote that I think kind of brings a lot of this together, um, hopefully. One of the things I was thinking as we were talking is that in rowing, there's different types of athletes. There's sometimes because you need strength and you need finesse. And some athletes are really strong, but often they don't have the finesse. They just put in the power. And then you need the people with finesse who can sort of like wrap around that, really sense into it and adapt to it and like make it work. So I was one of the sensors, adapters, flowers. Um, and that... And I can, I, like, I can't, I can feel it in my body much more deliberately than I can describe it. Like, I have such a felt sense of it. But that's how I show up. That, that was gave me my sense of belonging. That's how I showed up in relationships before rowing. That's how I show up after. And it, it, it takes things going supremely south for me to realize in my body, in how I'm feeling, for me to realize, oh, I'm in that unconscious pattern. So... How do you work with people? I mean, just for listeners of getting curious about their own patterns, their own training. How do you work with people to to get that conscious, make that known before the body has to announce it by, you know, some injury or health issue or something like that? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I do is help people. I sometimes talk about this as surfacing the invisibles. So we get these. Yeah. We, we get these patterns, right, on autopilot, and they're behavioral patterns, but we can reveal them through the body. So let me see if I can think of an example. Okay, the one that happens to be coming to mind is a client that I worked with that had a really hard time setting boundaries. And she actually came to me to, to work on, like, I really need to set more clear boundaries at work because I automatically take on too much. I automatically say yes. And not only do I say yes, but I volunteer for things that I don't need to volunteer for. And then I'm at work till nine at night. And, you know, it's not because I'm trying to get ahead or trying to, it's just a habit that I'm in. Right. And while we were working together, she had a family member that she had a very difficult relationship with become very ill. So she also became a caretaker to someone who um, she she had a lot of time, uh, uh, had had a very long lifetime history of like difficulty setting boundaries with, 
right? So she all of a sudden was like in the crucible of here in this relationship where I originally happened to learn how not to set boundaries, the thing that I'm doing at work, I'm getting sort of sucked back in to not set or setting boundaries. And we did two things. One was kind of discovery and one was a, a practice to help her shift. So the discovery was paying attention to, okay, when you automatically agree to stay later to take care of this person who does need your care and who you do care about, right? But you, uh, you kind of automatically acquiesce. What's going on mm -hmm. physically for you in those moments? So what she was able to notice was my heart beats faster. There's a churning in my stomach and everything kind of clamps down. I'll clamp down my jaw. My eyes get tight. And I'm, you know, she would describe herself as really frustrated and wanting to leave or wanting to set a boundary or wanting to say, I've been here five hours. It's all I can commit to you today. I'll be back tomorrow or next week or whatever the, you know, agreement was. Um, and uh, so she really, so like that surfacing the invisibles. And the way I do that is by asking a lot of detailed questions because it's actually hard for us to see ourselves through this lens. So I might ask her something like, okay, you're in that moment. You're being asked to please stay longer like put yourself there in your memory and notice even right now, as you're reacting to that memory, what's happening in your chest. Do you feel more hot or cold? Do you feel more tight or open? Do you feel more movement or stillness? Do you, right? So asking really detailed questions, maybe about different parts of her body, what's going on in your belly area do you feel more movement or is everything clamped down well i'm i'm tight and holding but there's like a growling in my stomach right so that's kind of the surfacing the invisibles and then we developed a practice around setting boundaries and i had her take her office chair which was a rolling chair and physically push it away from her and say, we, we came up with a number of different phrases, but say something like, this is all I can do, or I'm done now, or I've had enough, or just no, right? So she's physically making space work for herself. She's physically moving something away from herself. It was really hard for her to do that at first. Very, very uncomfortable. Um, activated all of the the physical discomfort that comes along with saying no and setting boundaries if that's something you've um not you you've developed a habit of not saying no in order to belong right and so we we're kind of training her body to get more comfortable have less of an uncomfortable visceral reaction to the words saying no, or I'm done now, or I need to leave, or this is enough, or I've taken on enough for today, right? Whatever the phrases were that she came up with, I don't remember them now. And, um, but all of those are, are good examples, right? Um, but also having a physical piece of that. So it's really different to just be like, well, how you can say no, like just say no, right? <laughs> Versus Practice saying no, feel all the discomfort of saying no, and get used to that discomfort and keep making the move, making the move anyway, so that you can make the move in your life. That's an example. Um, I'm resonating with this because I've had to do a lot of work around the the safety and discomfort of making a mistake very very hard for me or what's what I perceive as a mistake and you and when you say discomfort I mean it's not just discomfort it's panic it's, like it feels it's, yeah, really it's unsafe full body it, it, yeah full body discomfort. panic and so I think it's really important to just say that is like for someone when they're retraining a pattern it is sometimes for some it can be to that extreme for me it it feels very very unsafe to make a mistake like really like life or death 
I know it sounds extreme, but I've tried to explain this to my husband, but like <laughs> it feels that mm-hmm. way when I started. Can I say something? Can I say something yeah. about that, Iris? Yeah. Just, um, yes, it feels life or death because of those evolutionary pressures, right? Mm-hmm. The, the brain is trying to put on autopilot the things that did keep us safe, keep us belonging, and keep us as respected as possible in the environments where it was important for us to have those things. We, The discomfort is there for a really good, adaptive, intelligent reason. So it's generally not a way that we're broken, but it can induce really uncomfortable experiences like feelings of panic, right? Mm -hmm. And that's very real because it's taking care of something really important. And the key thing is how do we develop other strategies for taking care of those important things that aren't just, I'm gonna panic and be sure that I get every single part of this right. Be sure mm-hmm. that I don't. Like, how can you develop another pattern that also takes care of safety, belonging, respect? And maybe that's how we bring this home is to maybe say one thing that we've each done um, in that spirit, in that hope. Iris? Well, you take Dr. Amanda Blake's course on <laughs> the body is the brain. <laughs> I mean, truly, it's been an evolution of many things. To your point, Whitney, it's not just one thing, but it's a multitude of things. And, and you know, I found you, Mandy, because this was part of my journey is I don't want to be stuck in this state. Um, I want I know that I. I have, I trust myself to move beyond the state of panic. Um, and, but I had to build that trust. And by, by learning more about how the systems work, the science behind the systems really helped me to understand, oh, what's happening. You know, I may feel unsafe in the moment, but everything's okay. And learning the science and learning, right? So learning is a huge part of my, me. And so doing that was really helpful. I, uh, another piece is I've done internal family systems too. It, it really, and I'm doing it now. It's very, very helpful, but I think it's something I never did as an athlete that I do now. That is my number one now, which is I am really attuned to taking care of myself. Meaning mm-hmm. I know that if I'm in a state of, if I don't eat well, if I'm tired, um, if I do too much, I, I'm, going to fail quote unquote when I'm trying to retrain myself so it is important that I make sure all these baseline things I call them baseline things are Mm. to uh, have attention and the other thing too is real intense compassion for myself has been very like ruthless compassion for myself because I never had That's that as an athlete. An interesting term, Iris. <laughs> yeah, but ruthless because I could be ruthless with myself as an athlete, right? How mm-hmm. many athletes go like, come on, you know, yes. do it, do it more. Why aren't you doing never. it this way? We we end up with these these patterns, especially from sports, because that's how uh, many of us grew up in the 90s and 2000s. So I'm ruthlessly compassionate. So I think about like, all right, we kind of feel bad right now. What do you need? And I will mm-hmm. give myself a literal hug. Or I'll say, I just need a moment to watch a couple of Instagram reels to laugh. Or I need to call Whitney. Or I need to read Dr. Amanda Blake's book, you know, so I think it's, I never did that for myself ever, ever. And at 43, it is the one thing that at the end of the day, if I can be ruthlessly compassionate and and be kind to myself, it is the one thing that will help with that, that sense, that, that discomfort. Yeah. That's, I, that's really really beautiful iris and really interesting i agree like the ruthless compassion it's an it's an interesting juxtaposition but i i get it right the bringing a similar level of commitment to ensuring those baselines are met as you would to your sport in the way that you did right so yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I think I already talked about how kind of learning to 
love my typos and kind of get um, easier, more comfortable with the idea of, you, you know, maybe not fall on, flat on my face in public, <laughs> but like I can make some mistakes. It doesn't have to be precision perfect. Um, but another one that I'll, that I'll share is learning. I had to learn how, and still am learning for a long time now how to sense my own preferences. Mm. So partly really? because absolutely because of the nature of synchronized swimming where you are so um you are doing most of the, I mean whatever we do we we break it up a group does this and a group does that right it's not you're not always doing exactly the same thing as your teammates but when you're on a team of 8 um a lot of the time you're doing exactly the same thing as the person next to you so that was the sport and then in my family life I had a lot of that similar kind of message. We're all going to do things together. We're all going to operate as a family. We're all going to, and I have a very large extended family. So those two things contributed to a wiring in of in order to belong and in order to perform, just overriding my own preferences. Like I often just didn't know what they were. And earlier in life, somebody might ask me like, where do you want to go to dinner? And I would essentially go into a freeze state where I, you know, like I maybe get a little glassy eyed, couldn't really get words out, not really, I don't know. And that's all I could really say. I don't know where I want to go to dinner. You choose. And, and my voice might get a little quiet like that. Like it just did. I didn't do that on purpose, but just going back to that place. And I might feel really tight and tense and a little spaced out just to even like feel my own preferences was a big, big sense of threat and discomfort. And so I really had to learn first how to actually sense that. Like physically, somebody said to me in college, will you just follow your own heart? And I was like, what does that mean? I don't really understand what you're saying, right? Like for me, it was a very difficult concept to even grasp. So I actually had to learn to sense myself more deeply, more specifically, like what are what, what does my heart feel like? What am I drawn towards? And then to to really learn like that following that was okay. And following that often felt really just uncomfortable to me in the way that you talked about, Iris, like inducing a bit of a sense of panic even sometimes. So re like unlearning the skipping over, relearning a stopping and checking in with myself, an actual sensing, and then getting comfortable enough to like make the move and realize, oh, the panic was unnecessary. I didn't die. I'm mm -hmm. still safe. I still belong. Mm -hmm. Right. I still have these connections with people who respect me. That's beautiful. I would say what I've learned is that before the ways I moved through the world was using my body to get what I wanted. I would use my body by starving it. I would use my body by pushing it. I would, you know, whatever it was to get what I wanted that I thought would give me belonging. And it's taken me decades and many, many, many outside resources to learn how to listen to it to get what I want. And so I would say that's the poetic difference for me is using versus listening to 50 years later. Well said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're here. Well, this has been as delightful as I thought it would be, and even more so. The hardest part was sitting still and not jumping up and down and dancing around the room because that's what I wanted to do because all these ideas were so fun and engaging for me. Um, Iris, what do you want to say? Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm really in awe of two fantastic women who we had a wonderful dance and conversation with together for the second time. So I feel really lucky and very honored to do it. It's, well, you, you know, um, even meeting you for the first time and talking to you the first time, um, Mandy was a huge pleasure and an honor. I still feel the same way today. And I just, I'm happy. This makes me happy. I'm like tearful. I feel joyful. Thank you for um, having this conversation today. And I hope, I hope it does hearing our stories and our backgrounds. I hope it moves people to the place where they feel a sense of, you know what? I can also move past some of this panic or I can move past some of this. There, there are resources, there, 
there are things to learn and things to do that we can move past and, and retrain ourselves, which is, <laughs> which I hope people receive today. All right. We have reached the end. What do we say at the end of every podcast, Whitney? Keep on training. Keep on training. If you like what you hear in the content, please go to our YouTube or podcast channels to subscribe. Like and subscribe. Thanks, tribe, untrained tribe. See you next time. You belong. Bye.